Now, everyone's talking about Tom and Molly Martins and what has gone on in the US. And, you know, there's a lot of narrative coming back, essentially, that they've got away with it. They're probably not going to spend any more time in prison. How can this possibly happen? This case has caused a big divide between the US and Ireland for a long time. There's at the centre of it, the victim, Jason Corbett, and um, a much loved father of two from Limerick, whose family have very much sort of been through the mill with the US system. And then you have the Martins in the in North Carolina who have claimed repeatedly, they've admitted that they killed Jason Corbett, but they've repeatedly claimed that they did so because they were defending themselves. Uh, Tom Martins is a former FBI agent and his daughter, Molly, came to Ireland to work as an au pair for Jason um, and they got married. Now, these plea deals, we hear of them all the time, but in the US, they're kind of part and parcel of the justice system. Yeah, well, they are very much more common in, in the US now. They happen here, obviously, as well. The DPP can accept lesser charges and somebody will plead guilty. It's obviously not uncommon, um, but it's far more common in the US uh, where it just it's just part of the fabric. Um, so they've accepted a, a plea of voluntary manslaughter instead of uh, second degree degree murder, which would be a kind of a less premeditated version of murder, I suppose, in, in under the American system. But there's no doubt from reading social media um, for, from Jason's family and supporters that they find this to be a grubby deal. And it's easy to see why, really. Um, as part of uh, Molly Martin's plea, it is there's a plea of no contest, which is effectively... Uh, her, she admits to voluntary manslaughter, but doesn't accept, I suppose, responsibility for what she has done uh, in killing a man. Um, yeah. She doesn't accept uh, a narrative. Tom Martins um, accepts a narrative of that he used excessive force, basically, to paraphrase it. Um, and I can see why that's deeply, deeply upsetting because, um, you know, how Jason Corbett died, the level of violence used, and then the incredible aftermath in how Molly Martins behaved towards the Corbett family. Uh, it must be very distressing. Um, even today, you're hearing Tom Martin's defence counsel and they're saying they're going to introduce this extraordinary evidence uh, suggesting um, that that Jason killed his first wife. Mm. Uh, you I know, they're going to do that. I mean, listen, I'm so glad that we have, and when we finish our discussion here, we're going to play the interview with Lynn Kelleher, a journalist um, friend of ours who made a documentary for Virgin Media in the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to sort of retry. Because, of course, both Molly and Tom Martin were found guilty of murder. In a previous court case, they appealed it and that decision went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided that they needed to be retried. And this is where we have been ever since. They've been out on bail. They've been sort of essentially enjoying their freedom and waiting to see. They were facing a new trial when this plea bargain was done in the background. But Lynn's um, investigation into the case goes through a lot of really intricate detail and I would urge anybody to listen on to it. You know, she got all the 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 uh, autopsy reports. She got evidence that uh, while um, it being interviewed in the aftermath of this killing, that b the father, Tom Martin, suggested that he'd been drinking all afternoon, as did Molly Martin. She has the detail of what alcohol was in his blood, which was minimal. So it's really, really interesting. And it goes through. And of course, we have recordings of their actual interviews um, when they're first arrested, just in the hours after he's dead. I don't think you could listen to Lynn's piece or watch those interviews or read those files and believe fully that this was... Look, we can all understand a narrative that a, f a couple are having a row and somebody intervenes and, you know, things happen. But when you listen to the evidence, it's almost impossible to believe that narrative. Mm. Um, she's this Molly Martins who was claiming to be uh, suffering an attack has no injuries. Um, they both happened to have weapons to hand. Um, Tom Martins had access to a baseball bat. He claimed he was going to give us a present. Um, Molly Martins had access to a brick, which was used to basically beat him to death. On her bedside locker. Yeah, and she was claiming this was going to be uh, decorated by the kids. So, you know, it's 
She's detailing in, in, in this interview down to, uh, you know, an observation about a very fine piece of jewellery that Molly Martins has on her arm. And, you know, she's looking at the photographs taken in the exact aftermath of the killing of Jason Corbett and is pointing out how is this little delicate piece of jewellery, how does it survive a kind of a scuffle and this, yeah. this fight? But I think I have to say for the families, one of the most offensive things that's happening at this stage is the fact that they are allowed to bring that back into the court. Yeah, so this is obviously Jason uh, Corbett. Um, Margaret was his first Margaret wife. Margaret was his first wife. Um, they had two kids together. Um, she died of an asthma attack in 2006 when uh, their daughter, Sarah, was only weeks old. Three months. Three months mm. old. So um, she died. Uh, he rushed her to the hospital. Um People die of asthma actually all the time, have asthmatic myself. So, you know, it happens. A good number of people die every year. Um, we had one case recently of a, a, a girl who died. She couldn't get an inhaler and died in Dublin city centre, a teenage girl. So that was investigated. There was an inquest. The facts are there. It's clear. It's beyond doubt. So today, uh, nonetheless, we have the defence counsel. Uh, his name is Douglas Kingsbury saying they're going to introduce significant evidence to say that um, Jason basically strangled his first wife. And to that, death. Th that Tom was of the belief that he'd killed his first wife and that he was going to kill his daughter, Molly. Yes. And I mean, they're saying they're going to introduce significant evidence. Like it's clear they're not going to introduce no, significant what evidence. What can they have? I mean, that's they won't. outrageous, really. Yeah, they're not going to have significant evidence. What they may have is tittle tattle and rumour. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't get away with it, as far as I can see, no. in, this, in a court in this country introducing. I mean, anybody can say, oh, I heard my friend down the road said he he did this and that. It's not significant evidence. That's the word they use, significant mm. evidence. It's going to be something else. It's going to be nothing less than... Uh, but, I mean, it's, it is just disgusting for the family, yeah. for, for her family and for um, the Corbett family and Jason's children. And remember, the, the, the family, Jason's first wife, his family yeah. remained... That's what I mean. ...really close to Jason. Really close. They went over to visit him when he was in the States. Exactly. But I mean... That lady died from an asthma attack. Yeah. And in actual fact, it was a horrific scenario that three-month-old baby and a, a two-year-old child. Yeah, son. And he who are, who are, called the ambulance. They're living out in Limerick, out in Ballyneat. He calls the ambulance. You know yourself. It takes a little longer sometimes than in a city environment. And he got so panicked, he really knew she was really, really struggling that he put her in the car and drove to meet the ambulance. And he was devastated after she died. And um, no but, suggestion. But you know, funny enough, and it'll be on this podcast um, because Lynn has furnished us with the interviews that were taken the day after the death of, of Jason Corbett. But Tom Martins introduced that literally the minute practically he sat down and he said to the guards that were there to interview him about what had happened, he admitted that he had hit him. Um, he admitted he'd killed him, but he immediately brought up this situation that he believed. He actually called it uh, asphyxiation. Yeah. He asphyxiated his first wife, he said. Yeah, well, look, he can say whatever he wants, but there's a cause of death given by the medical examiner in Ireland, and that's going to be the fact. I mean, the other sad thing about it is that Jason's two kids are there, yeah. uh, and Mags is, they're in court today. Um, they're, they're, they're listening to that. Looking at that, you know, looking at the Martins. Yeah, looking at them and having to hear that in a way that they can't defend their mother, Jack and Sarah. They're there in yeah. court today. So it's really, it's, it's That's hard. That's just a system. That's disgusting. No, it's har it's heartless. And, you know, look, let's, if you look at what the motivations in this case were, um, Molly Martin's, by any definition, was a troubled soul. Now, there's plenty of troubled souls who never commit crime. So I'm not saying that, but she was a fantasist, a liar. And she obviously um, had a desire to adopt those two children. Um, he, Jason, was resisting that. Um, and, you know, if he was out of the picture, she clearly wanted to adopt them and take control of that situation. And I mean, you know, that that's that's a big part of this underlying this case, which Lynn also goes into. But I mean, if you think about her actions uh you know, what's going to be presented in this case by the by the prosecution, by the police, is that these this chil these two children that she was meant to love and care for and according to herself 
was, you know, their mother and, you know, had had put them before everything. What they're what the prosecution are going to present is this as an aggravating situation that these two children were in the house while their father was beaten to death and beaten to death, which he has to accept now by Molly Martins. Um, you know, so where where is the love and care there, you know? Um, you know, and Molly Martins, uh, in the aftermath of, of Jason's death, continued like a, a relentless campaign uh, towards the corporate yeah. family in order to keep control of those children, you know? So it, it's, look, I mean... I don't know how they feel. Um, they they are obviously tweeting some members of the family. Living in a very loving home and a very stable home with their yeah. aunt and uncle and their well, cousins, they were taken in. Yeah. And um, but Sarah has has spoken. Yeah. She's Sarah become a, a very uh, public voice. Yeah. Very strong voice. We've seen her on on in various uh, on TV, and she's written a book. So, I mean, it's really, really shocking that they're still kind of being used as pawns at this stage by the Martins family. And on top of it, the sentencing, which is, sorry, is it coming this week? The sentencing? Well, I think they say it could go on for two weeks, which seems very right. long, but there will be, so... The, this, the, the sentence hearing is going to go on for two weeks. Well, this is, they've begun the sentence yeah. hearing now and, you know, they're presenting, the defence are, go, are going first, but the prosecution will present Very other good. aspects of it. And, you know, they're really, they're looking at, um, both Molly Martins and Tom Martin served three and a half years I think in prison uh, before their appeal was heard um, I think there's discussion about where they could I think it's sort of somewhere between three and seven years Yeah. so in other words they could have served their time already yes. because it'll be taken into account Yes. they may not may not serve another day in prison for this yeah. crime um, anyway with that waits to be see, seen but I think um, anybody listening stay with this because if you want to know the facts and the reality of how Jason Corbett died. That's coming up now. Yeah, very much so. My name is Tom Martin. I'm at 116 Panther Creek Court. And we need help. What do you mean he's in bad shape? He's hurt? He's bleeding all over? I, I can't kill him. Lynn, I suppose we start with the person who lies at the heart of this story, and that's Jason Corbett. Um, so who was he, and how did he meet Molly Martins? So he's a Limerick man who grew up in Janesborough, in the heart of Limerick City. Um, he was one of eight. He was a twin. And he got a job in this multinational packaging company when he was younger and kind of went up through the ranks. He was very ambitious, very hardworking, and he went up through the ranks very fast and kind of became went into a management position. Um, in the late 90s then, he met his first wife, Margaret, and she was running a creche, um, a lovely woman by all accounts, great with kids, and they had a romance, very romantic relationship. He was He was, by all accounts, very romantic person mm. and they got married down in Spanish Point in Clare and moved into this lovely home in Badiniti and had two children, two young children. So he was probably in his late 20s, early 30s, was he? He was in his late 20s at that stage and then when the youngest child, Sarah, he did a boy, Jack, who was two years of age, when the youngest child, Sarah, was three months old, she had an asthma attack. She was in the house in Badiniti and... Her sister was staying with them at the time as well and she had an asthma attack and it's described in his sister's book how she was rushed in a car. First of all, they called an ambulance, but he was in such a rush to get her to the hospital that he, he got into the car and then he met the ambulance and she was brought to hospital, but she died. She had had a severe asthma attack and at that stage, he was around 30 years of age right. and the youngest child was three months old, Sarah, and Jack was two years so of age. So it sounds like they sort of had it all. They had, you know, what ultimately every young couple would want. They had a romance which led to the marriage and then lovely house, two kids, one after the other, boy and a girl. And then, you know, out of the blue, everything goes completely and utterly like the worst nightmare. 
Yeah, and they did seem to have, well, people would describe it as a kind of a fairy tale romance that they, they got married. Their wedding seemed to be extremely happy. It was down off the coast of Clare and next to the, the beach and the pictures there, they, they just mm. look, it's very idyllic kind of a setting, but they, they look very happy, the two of them. And yeah, they, they did, life was great for them. He had, he had worked really hard. He'd come from a kind of a working class, maybe background in Limerick mm. City and had done really well for himself yeah and he was really happy he was really into sports he was really into rugby loads of friends loads of mutual friends so everything was going great for them can't kind of underestimate how incredibly traumatizing that must have been for his young wife and with two young children to have that kind of an attack um in his home in front of his eyes that he was desperate to try and get her help and she essentially died pretty much in his arms while he was trying to get her to the to to get help, medical help. It must have been horrendous. Horrendous. And it was very sudden, I suppose, as well. Mm. And then all of a sudden, then in the aftermath, he's got these two children to raise himself. And he has this career as well. So initially, I think the family kind of just rallied around. Well, they always rallied around, but they were kind of doing the childcare for him. And he was trying to get his life back together. What age were the kids, two and just... Three Three months old. Three months old. Yeah. Right. So as it went on over the coming months or maybe a year or so, he, his family were really rowing in, but he wanted to um, assert his independence, I suppose. And he, he, he wanted to try and get back to some semblance of a normal life. So he started to bring up pairs into the equation. So he'd be able to live at home and he'd mm. be able to work and he'd have somebody at home looking after the kids because instead of dropping them and collecting them, I think the, the au pair kind of situation yeah. worked much better. For Gives them. a bit more stability, especially when they're younger like that, that there's somebody yeah. there. And if you're late coming in from work or anything, it's not, you're not constantly relying on, on yes. relatives. And I think because, you know, he, he was trying to be independent, you know, he, he and he would have been the only person dropping and collecting yeah, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So that's how he ended up getting into au pairs. And I think he had a few au pairs, he had two or three au mm. pairs, but... Au pairs can be quite short term. And I think then with the last one in the book, it says that she was called home. The the last au pair he had before Molly Martins arrived into his life, she was called home in some family emergency and he was kind of left a bit Mm -hmm. high and dry and it would have meant he needed more time off work. So he got this CV in and the CV was kind of dazzling. It was this, she was in her 20s. She was had all these qualifications. She was a swim coach. It said she was a qualified foster carer. And she was American, Lynn, which was kind of, I'm sure there's not that many American uh, au pair, pairs looking to come to Ireland. Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. So I suppose, that, yeah, bef- there would be the language barrier because yeah. normally an au pair comes to the country to learn a language. Mm. I've had a few au pairs myself and they would have come from Germany. So they come to learn the language. They're young girls. And that's the reason they're kind of getting a, an experience and then they're learning the language on top of it. But yet, yeah, so I, I think that can be difficult as well because there's an initial um period where the, the, the language isn't great and yeah. you're kind of getting used to that and they're settling into the household. So there's a lot of this. So I suppose when you when you'd hear that and then that there's an English speaking person, it's such a bonus, mm-hmm. you know, and and the, and especially with the kids probably were starting. The little girl was probably starting to learn words at that stage and maybe, you know, learning sentences and she would have been probably what, two ish. Yes, so she's around two at that stage. Yes, yeah. so she's, and I think so. Molly arrived over. Um, so you got the CV. Sorry, I interrupted you. And she was, she wasn't only English speaking, but she was, she had an amazing CV, really, hadn't she? Yes, it was a qualified Montessori teacher, graduate of the prestigious Clemson University. She was on the fringes of the U.S. Olympic swimming team, according to this CV. So it was, yeah, it was very dazzling. And it, as well, it was her age because she was kind of in her 20s. So, you know, there was a maturity there. Mm. So it all looked, you know, too good to be true, really. Mm-hmm. This was a, a kind of a real kind of American Mary Poppins kind yeah. of style person coming into his life. And then he's probably in a kind of a very frantic situation because he's just lost his au pair. So he really wants to get some and this CV pops mm. in and it's like, oh, this is fantastic. I, I've got exactly it what sounds I Sounds like for. things are going right for him maybe for once when he sees it. I recall you and I speaking to some um, friends of his and them telling us that while she had initially come through an agency, that once they began talking 
him and Molly, I presume through the agency and online or whatever, they quickly sort of moved away from the agency because there was certain um, processes in place that would have delayed um, her coming to work for him and, and there was all these sort of red tape. So instead, the two of them made the arrangement themselves. I think he probably thought she was perfect ideal. Let's get her over as quick as possible. Yes, and, and then we were told that she initially arrived into Shannon Airport and one of his friends was in the the departure lounge and she saw this girl arrive in and she kind of had a cowboy hat, was that mm. correct? And she had... She stood out. She looked really, really well. She was a very, very pretty girl. and Yes, and... She, was, she wasn't what she was expecting a nanny to look like or an au pair to look like. And, but at that stage, she didn't get into Shannon Airport because her it was some problem with her visa. Right. Yeah. She yeah. got in, so she'd paid for the flight to come over yeah. and she was turned on her heel back to America, which would have put a lot off. Yes, so then and she arrives back is it two weeks later. So she buys another ticket to come to Dublin. So, you know, this is real determination because... You're thinking of au pairs as well. They they don't tend to, they're students. They don't mm. tend to have a whole pile of money. Um, so she's bought two tickets. She's bought a ticket to Shannon, gone back, then got whatever she's got, gone to Dublin and got a second ticket. So she was really determined to come. Like it hadn't put her off. Mm. But it, it, that's a funny one. It's a kind of a sliding doors moment that mm. things could have been very different from him. Absolutely. If, if she hadn't got in through Dublin. So nonetheless, she she comes down to his home in Limerick and settles in. And, um, you know, people think that she's, you know, she's the real deal. She she gets on really well with the kids, doesn't she? And she's sociable enough with his friends and family. Yes. I mean, she seems to be absolutely brilliant with the kids and really focused on the kids. Um, I think they found her a bit quiet at the start, but they were just happy that the kids were happy and that he seemed happy. And I think then after a few months, um, his sister's book relays how they started seeing a smile on his face again and he seemed to be happy. And then after a while, it emerged that they were in a relationship together. And I think people were happy with this situation as well because it seemed like he was maybe getting on with his life and he was after such a turmoil of the last two or three years that things were maybe turning a corner and if the kids were happy and he were was happy, I think the family were mm-hmm. happy in that situation. Did they come out and say they were in a relationship or did people, did the penny kind of drop, I wonder? I think some people maybe got an inkling, you know, at, at the start mm. and then maybe... There was a reluctance to to initially announce the relationship, but yeah, it was, uh, it was after a few months then that mm. it, it came out. And like after the trauma, it seemed like a bit of a fairy tale, didn't it? That this beautiful blonde Tennessee all American superstar arrives over, falls in love with his children, and then in love with him. I mean, it's everything you could probably want for somebody who had been visited by such tragedy so young. Um, yeah. And I mean, she is very all-American. She's so wholesome looking, Molly Martins. And she's this image that you might have of a cheerleader, this real all-American girl. She's great at sports. Mm. She's got the blonde hair. She was, you know, she was great with the kids. That's what stood out. You'd always hear people say that she was really focused in on the kids and she absolutely adored the kids. So, it, yeah, it did seem to be working out well for them. So the relationship, obviously, you know, continued going from strength to strength and, at some point, it was clear that this wasn't just going to be a boyfriend-girlfriend situation and, and he proposed to her, didn't he? He proposed to her in 2010 and then he had sold his house in Ballyneasy that he'd shared with his first wife and then um, it emerged that she was getting homesick. It emerged afterwards, actually, that she was sending him emails. She was getting homesick. She wanted to go back to America and a job comes up in America with his packaging company in Limerick they have a branch in America and she persuades him to take it and I think he he really agonised over leaving Limerick he agonised over leaving all his family all his friends he was really into sports I think he was really into Munster rugby so it was a huge decision for him but I think as well from his sister's book it was part of his decision was that it was a fresh start for him that it was it was it was a He loved America and this was a fresh start and a kind of a new life. And that's what kind of seemed to have changed his mind. And The children were probably young enough as well to make that kind of big a move. You know, if they were older, you might have thought, 
longer and harder about it. And nothing really unusual about this young woman from Tennessee getting homesick. You know, she she'd come over um by all intents and purposes, to take a short job, you know, or whatever. Certainly she hadn't intended to, to stay. Um, and she missed her own family and um, her friends as such or whoever she had back in the States. So everything seems normal. Or can we say there's any red flags at this stage? Well, I think looking back afterwards, family can see various red flags. I think there was one instance of her being very depressed and a friend calling in and finding her kind of curled up in a ball or, or he returned with Jason and find her, found her curled up in a ball. There was a few things that she said that seemed to be lies. The family, that they would have come across a few things like that, but not... Lies or tall tales, did they see them as? To, maybe tall tales. I think there was kind of a question of her, was it skydiving? Mm. Um... And maybe I think the brother was there and he said she didn't do it. I remember somebody describing her as one of these people, and we can all probably relate to this, that anything you can do, I can do better. So if you had a story about, as you say, skydiving, she would have done 10. If you had have won a medal for swimming, she'd have been the Olympic team member. She was always kind of cutting in with these kind of more and more fantastical, I suppose, as time went on, stories of achievements and... Um, yeah, kind of a Walter Mitty mm. kind of a character, definitely. But I don't think people were putting it together because they were seeing it mm. in in separate situations. I think maybe afterwards, after all this had played out, when they talked to each other, they would have said, oh, well, you saw that and you saw that. But if, ever, if they had spoken to each yeah. other, maybe it would have fitted in better and they would have raised more red flags. But I don't think it did... At that mm. stage. So he, the the two of them took off to North Carolina where they bought what looks like an absolutely fabulous house there in Panther Creek, a uh, typical American estate. And um, they move in there and they get married. Yes. So their wedding is in a place called Bleak House, Ooh. which is maybe foreboding um, in Tennessee. And it was a really hot day. She was there with Jason. The kids were involved in the ceremony. There were like flower girls and page boy. Um, and all the, the family came over from, from Limerick. And then there was her family from America. But in the previous days, a few things had started. The red, red flags had started to come up mm. because they had there had been various kind of get togethers to introduce the Limerick side of the family to the American side of the family. And a few things had popped up that one, one of the American friends had said to one of the Limerick friends that this story that uh, Molly had told them that she was a pen pal of, of um, Jason's first wife, Margaret, and that Margaret had made her promise to look after the kids. When she died, or if she died, basically. Yes, and then there was another story that she was sick and she'd asked her to look after the kids. So there was these, they were very shocked by this. Mm -hmm. And I think even one of his friends, you know, tried to speak to him for the wedding and said, you know, you, you this maybe is don't weird. Have, this yeah. is weird, you don't have to go through this. Yeah. But the, for the sense I get from his sister's book is that he thought his kids had already lost one mother mm -hmm. and they didn't want to lose. He didn't want to be responsible for them losing another one. Mm. Because at this stage, she had a very, very strong relationship with the kids. Yeah. I mean, you can see how that makes matters much more complicated. It's not as easy to walk away from a relationship when there's children involved and especially kids who've, you know, even though they mightn't have, unfortunately, had huge memories of their 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 own mother. Um, you know, there would have been trauma there and or certainly he would feel a responsibility to try and create a family home for them. Um, was it the families, the Irish family, I mean, first time of meeting Tom Martin and his wife Sharon was, had the two families, had they been over to Ireland at all or was that their first? I think it was the first time they met him properly. They had a, you know, they, they were there for a number of days and there were these pre-wedding parties um, and they got an impression of a kind of a cold man. Mm. They didn't feel he was very warm towards these, uh, the Irish visitors. Um, I suppose just a little bit of background on the Martins, who he is, what what his career was, which is relevant, and, um, you know, what types they were. 
yeah, there, there. He was an FBI agent for for thirty years, um, and he very well to do. I spoke to a a boy, an ex boyfriend of Molly's, and she, he would have described him as a kind of the country club set. Mm-hmm. You know, they were they were very wealthy. They his wife then is an academic. The whole family are kind of uh, high achievers. All the kids went to these Ivy League colleges and. Yeah, very high achieving, quite wealthy family. Um, so it was kind of unusual as mm-hmm. well that she would be going over to Ireland as an au pair. It doesn't sort of fit in with the rest of the the, the family. There are these A-type kind of... Like whatever you, about with the way you say, like they'd be going for a language if she was going to France or something to learn or Spain or... But coming to Ireland, what are you going to gain from that? And she's in her 20s. Mm. So she's not a teenager. So it is unusual that she's decided to... Uh, to go there but they kind of got this certain feeling of that he had a bit of disdain for the the Irish maybe he looked down on mm. drinking culture not that they were overly drinking or anything yeah. like that but there was this they, they felt he had a kind of a stereotypical image yeah. of mm. the Irish wedding went ahead nonetheless and um the family returned to Ireland I presume stay in touch with him on the phone and by email and Facebook and whatever other way family stay in touch did they um get the impression that things were going well or i think the family would, would come over and they they would visit um periodically they'd visit maybe once a year or there was certainly the fitzpatrick's were over as well and margaret these first wife's family were over and I, tracy corbett was over a lot um i don't think they necessarily had much they weren't spending the huge chunks of time with them. So they were there and they were in holiday mode and they were Mm. going different places with them. Mm -hmm. Life continues for everybody, but two years after the wedding, um, the Corbett's got a phone call that every family would dread. And the shocking death had occurred of Jason in his home in Panther Creek. Um, I'm sure the details from the beginning were sketchy, but nonetheless, he appeared to have been... uh, killed within the home um, and since then you've been collecting these murder files uh, which make up this documentary and I suppose this is really where your investigation starts um, when we come to those documents the piles and piles of documents you have there in front of you what happened on that night um, just a basic kind of an idea of what, what happened on that night and then we can go in to the more detailed examination that you, you have been working on for for the past few years the uh, the first time it 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 come comes out is at this 911 call which is at 3 hours 2 minutes and 17 seconds on August the 2nd so it's Tom Martin's ringing a 911 operator um and he's he has stayed over they have come up from Knoxville Tennessee where they live which is about a 4 hour drive away from this house in Panther Creek in North Carolina and he's calling the operator and he said he needs help. And he says, my son-in-law got into a fight with my daughter. I intervened. He's in bad shape. We need help. And she said, what do you mean he's in bad shape? He's bleeding all over and I may have killed him. So they were, this This was later played out in newsreels, which I think really shocked And now you actually have this 911 call. Yes. So maybe we should have a little listen to it. Um, my name is Tom Martin. I'm at 160 Panther Creek Court, and we need help. What's going on there? My, my uh, daughter's husband, uh, my son-in-law, uh, got in a fight with my daughter. I intervened, and I, I think um, he's in bad shape. We need help. Okay, what do you mean he's in bad shape? He's hurt? He's, he's bleeding all over and I, I may have killed him. So that's the actual 911 call in and, and Tom Martins is is the guy on the end of the phone while, you know, it is, you know, it's not exactly crystal clear. We can hear a sense of calm from his voice, can we? Yeah, there isn't, he isn't panicking. He's very matter of fact. He's given all the details. I was looking through the, the transcript of it just mm. before you came there and I just noticed... He, he's saying he's in bad shape, he's bleeding out. Then he gets in that he's been drinking during the course of the day. But then he says, she said, is there anyone there that can help you? And she says, my daughter. And she's in terrible shape. Mm-hmm. Which is very, 
you know, obviously Jason Corbett is lying there in badly beaten and and bleeding all over the place. And he's just like, when when, he, when when we're we're going through that nine 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 call, set the scene a little bit about, you know, what is. Where's he phoning? You know, what's happening around him while he's on this call, Tom Martins? So he will say later on that he has been woken up to, he hears thumping, he hears arguing, and he's staying in this basement bedroom. It's a three story house. And he is in the basement bedroom. And then he's the Molly Martins and her husband, Jason Corbett, his daughter and his son in law are staying in a bedroom almost above the basement. Bedroom. And then the kids are upstairs, so it's a it's a three story house. So this is, and he's staying downstairs with his wife Sharon Martins. He has come the night before at eight thirty, and they apparently came on a kind of a spur of the moment four hour drive from Tennessee mm. in Knoxville, and they have a few drinks, they have some pizza, and then they go to bed. And then he's woken up, and he says he goes up and he opens the door and he sees Jason Corbett with his arm around his his daughter's neck. And they get into an ensuing fight. This is what he claims. And he has a baseball bat that he's brought up with him from downstairs that he says he brought to give as a present to Jack Corbett, the young 10-year-old in the house. And he hadn't got a chance to give it to him. So he brings up this baseball bat. There's also a, a brick inside the bedroom that Molly will later say that she used to hit Jason. Mm. So there was a baseball bat and a brick used to repeatedly strike him. His head is just, there's a three-page autopsy report which talks of, you know, lacerations, contusions. Mm. There, there's injuries all over him, but especially his head, he's got he's got fractures, he's all sorts of um, scalp wounds, and he's been beaten around the head. So... And you, you've seen the crime scene photographs, and I think some of them are, are used, or will be used in, in Monday night's, documentary on Virgin um, without clearly, um, you know, the, it'll just be the scene as opposed to. But at this point in time that Tom is ringing, um, Jason Corbett's body is lying in a very chaotic, really bloodied scene within that house, isn't it? Yeah, it's in the master bedroom and there's, you know, lamps knocked over. There's blood stains everywhere. There's blood on the walls. There's blood stains going down from the bathroom into the bedroom. In that corridor there, there's there's uh, indents in the wall from the baseball bat. Mm. So there's clothes, there's kind the of... baseball bat has been used and we later hear that a baseball bat and a brick has been used. But he's making this call and his son-in-law is, well, we don't know if he's dead or alive still at this point, but he, he believes that he's he's ringing an ambulance, he's re- making a 911 call, he's calling for help. Um, does he, what happens next with the call? Do the, the, the ambulance people give him advice on what to do? Or do you think he's urgent enough in, in, in explaining how bad things are? Well, he's saying he can't tell and, and the operator is telling him how to do CPR and to do chest compressions and he says oh I'm familiar with that and as he go on goes on a bit further uh, Molly will say that she was qualified in in CPR mm. but they hadn't started the CPR by the time they they did the call they did it on the instructions of the uh, of the operator but it is somewhat chilling to hear that someone who has been beaten so badly whether they claim it's self-defense or not and then they're giving the CPR to the mm. person. That's a very strange juxtaposition. Was he drinking? Uh, yes, he had been drinking during the course of the day. Is he conscious at all? No. Is he breathing? No, I can't tell. Oh. All right, so we're going to start CPR. All right, I need you to make sure that his mouth and nose are clear. It's a mess. I'll set a pace for you. One, two, three, four. When he gets to 200 pumps, you're going to take over. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Keep pumping. Two, three, four. Like I've got lights here. They're, they're coming in now. Oh, just keep pumping. Y'all did a good job. That's Molly there that's giving the CPR. We can hear her voice for the first time. Um, paramedics, I think, were there within 10 minutes. 
And obviously the police followed. And what we know about that night then was that Tom Martins and Molly Martins were brought to the police station, the local police station, to be interviewed about the sequence of events. Yes, they're both down in the sheriff's office after six o'clock, around half six. So the call is made about 3.02. So within three hours, they're there and they're, they're wearing similar clothes. Well, he's certainly, Tom Martins is wearing a red T-shirt that has blood stains on it. He's wearing shorts and I think shoes and socks. And, and she's wearing the pyjamas that she wore that night, these blue kind of silky pyjamas. Mm. And they're they're interviewed at the same time because you can see from the video recordings, it's it's more or less... Uh, they're dual interviews. So he's in one room mm-hmm. and she's in another room and they're being asked about what the events of the previous night. So you you have actually managed to get these recordings, which is just the the difference between maybe the Irish and the American justice system that um, you can have access to this. But but you have um, got these these murder files and very interesting, these interviews that we can see them and we can see what's going on. Now, bearing in mind, these are in, as you say, the hours after he has been declared dead. Um, And um, I suppose, first of all, maybe we'll have a look at Molly Martins and just have a little a little look at how she is in, in in under questioning and then we can talk about her her demeanor and how you feel she she is behaving herself So, Lynn, she she is... Just describe her here and describe what we're looking at. So she's walked in. She's got these pyjamas on. She's got an overcoat. She's kind of hugging herself, looking very little girl lost. And, she's, and she has her hands up at her throat constantly when she's speaking. She's kind of rubbing around her throat area and tearful. Mm-hmm. She's sitting on one side of a brown wooden table and on the other side is an officer, um, a female officer who has two notebooks out in front of her and is obviously quizzing her really on what's happening. And she starts it by saying that they were having a fight. Yeah. So she she um, asks who, who, who was fighting and she said, my husband. And then she says, is that normal? And she kind of tearfully nods again and says, yes, it was. And then she asks her if there's a history of abuse in it, domestic abuse in the house. And she said, yes. And she said, how long has that been going on? And she says, forever. She kind of breathes out this, you know, kind of whispers forever. And she continues to, uh, then she said, did you ever go to the police? And she shakes her head mm. as in, in no. And then she said, did you ever go to the hospital? And she's kind of stumbling a bit here and mm. hesitating and saying, I went to the hospital a couple of times, but I didn't tell them what happened and holding the neck again. Mm-hmm. So there's no, you, you, she, there's no specific incidents. Oh, he did this to me. He mm-hmm. did that. He did the other. It's very, very vague that there was abuse forever, but she can't seem to say an instance. Was it Jason for him? Yeah. Yes. Would you say that she thought he was drunk? Yes. He was drunk. She's very adamant about that. That um, he was drinking. Yeah, they both are. Mm. They both suggests in numerous times um, in, in the interviews that he was drinking and Molly goes into her interview then and says he regularly drinks and then she goes into the binge drinking in Ireland. I mean, the drink is a big component of her interview and certainly Tom Martins also said said he was drinking a lot of the day. But the toxicology report then tells a very, very different story. So it kind of lists out, you get these reports and they list out different things, benzodiazepines, caffeine, Ethanol is is the is oh. is alcohol, and there's twenty mg's slash dl's. That's the way they measure it. Yeah. Now, uh, 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 in Ireland, I looked up the laws at the moment. If you're a, a driver, normal yeah. driver, not a young driver, you can have fifty. So MGs. he's twenty. So he's twenty. So he's on the lower lower scale Absolutely. Of, so of alcohol. What we call a sip. Yeah. You know. So it certainly doesn't tie in with drinking heavily all mm. day. You know, there was, a, I was talking to one law enforcement officer and he felt that there was, 
they were trying to paint this picture of a drunken Irish stereotype mm -hmm. into the... And certainly in her interview, she does, you know, the, the police officer actually asks her, she suggests, you know, Irish people drink a lot. Mm -hmm. And she suggests they did. And she said that he used to drink far more at home and he used to binge drink. Mm -hmm. So that that's a big component of the interview. And I think it's it's... So what she's trying to do, she's gone into the police station the hours after her husband's death and we will later, and she later admits that she hit him on the head with a brick and that her father also in the neighbouring cell, well, not cell, but interview room, is saying, admitting that he hit him with a baseball bat. Now they're claiming both of them self-defence for this, but nonetheless, they have gone in and she has gone in with a very clear narrative that there was a row and he had been drinking. So she's 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 saying two things very clearly there to the, the police officer. Um, from from looking at her in the interview room, she does have that sense of little girl law. She's rocking to and fro, but she's also pulling at her neck. And I think at one point the detective interviewing her tells her to stop or to take her hand away from her neck. But she's claiming that she's been attacked in the middle of the night by her husband, who's rather a lot bigger than her. Um, she's claiming that he was drunk when he did this. And yet there doesn't appear to be any marks on her. Not a mark on her. And she she does keep rubbing her neck and, and she, at the officer says, why do you keep grabbing your neck? And she said, I'm sorry, it hurts. And she said, did the paramedics take a look at it? And she said, they did, my throat hurts. She also asked, you know, did he do anything else? And she said, he might have elbowed me in the face. No sign of any mm. injury to her face, no sign of any. And there's close-up pictures of her neck. And you have those pictures of her taken at the scene before even she was brought into the interview room. So yes, these pictures were just... What's interesting about that picture as well, it's in front of us here, is she's she's outside the scene of the house and she's got a fur coat around her, but she has this very delicate bracelet around her Oh hand, yes, I can see it there. Around yeah. her wrist, which has obviously stayed intact, you know, throughout this. So for somebody who's had a scuffle, yeah, you know, it's a small delicate piece of jewellery hasn't been, um, been touched. And beyond... Uh, you know, in the interview room, I think um, a photographer is eventually brought in, isn't she? Yeah, she stands for the photographer. But you can see there, there's no marks in her hands. Yeah. There's, her neck is, you know, just completely clear. There's some marks on her face, which are blood, which I imagine are mm -hmm. not her, it's not her blood. From it, rubbing it, her it's, own it's, face. Yeah. So she's, she's remarkably unscathed in this whole thing. And we'll hear just now what she has to say and what the detective, how the detective knows, notices her rubbing her neck. Why do you keep rubbing her neck? I'm sorry. It hurts. I'm going to have to get some pictures and see if we can find any injuries. Uh, while while Molly is sort of vague and she's rocking to and fro and she's crying and um, she's talking about you know, she's talking as if she was very fearful of Jason. In the next interview room, her father, Tom, is much more controlled and he has a very clear story and no blanks in his memory. Is that? Yeah, he's very composed. He's he's almost comfortable looking. He walks in and he has his coffee and he's talking to the detectives and it's clearly he's kind of setting out that he's one of them. He tells them that he was 31 years as an FBI. Does he say that almost immediately? Immediately. And yeah. he says he was in counterintelligence and, and he was also in criminal. And then he sets out to see, he explains, he kind of nearly takes control of the situation and he sets out the scene and he explains things to them. And he uses phrases like battle in it. Mm. And, you know, he says at the start, but I'll, we'll just get down to the nitty gritty. But he's kind of like this. It seems like he almost sees this as a formality. He has to come in here, talk to these fellow law enforcement officers and explain just what happened, that he was standing up for his daughters and he was trying to save her life. And then, you know, he'll he'll go. So we'll have a little listen to him. I think he's he's really quite clinical about it. So I open the bedroom door and he's got Molly by the throat. And I hit him. out and he grabs the bat and he's stronger than I am and he pushes me down 
and I'm scrambling on the floor, and the glasses fall off. Now I'm thinking, who's going to kill me? At the start of it, he says it'll be helpful if he just kind of launches into this story because it'll contribute to his state of mind. And he's just been asked who was in the house. So he's setting out that it was himself and his wife, Sharon, and then his daughter and his son-in-law. And he, then he talks about the two children and he explains that they aren't his daughter's children, that they're um, Jason Corbett's children from his first marriage. And then he says he's an Irish citizen. He was married in Ireland. He had those two children. His first wife died in mysterious circumstances. The finding was that she had an asthma attack in his car. She died of asphyxiation. He says to the two police officers. He says to the two police officers. So he's immediately, this is about a minute and a half into the interview, and he's immediately casting doubt on the death of Jason Corbett's first wife. Margaret, he's kind of suggesting that... Asphyxiation. Well, that sounds like somebody was strangled. And he says mysterious circumstances. Mm. And he said, that was in my mind. So he's kind of saying to the officers, this is the background to me. So he's saying to them that this is a man to be feared. Yes, he said, this this is it. This is Mm. in the back of my mind when I went in and I saw my daughter with his hands around her throat. So this situation with his first wife is in the back of his mind. Mm -hmm. So we've documents here that we got from the court in America, but they were sent across from Limerick and it's an affidavit from a doctor, T.P. Casey, And at the end of the affidavit, he says, I say that the death certificate notes that the cause of death to be due to an acute respiratory arrest secondary to bronchospasm in a known asthmatic. Mm -hmm. There's a further document then that we found, which was sworn testimony from her father. From Margaret's father. Margaret's father, Michael Fitzpatrick, who has since passed away. And he says that she had suffered from severe asthma all her life. Mm -hmm. So Tom Martins has taken it upon himself to tell the police officers that she died from asphyxiation and it was in mysterious circumstances. Yes. That's a very different, I mean, it's it's a very uh, loaded way of saying what happened, more than loaded. Absolutely loaded. Mm. And it comes so quickly into the interview and you'd have to think that it was premeditated to Mm -hmm. say this just he's setting the scene he literally says I'm going to set the scene for you and then he he goes into the fact that she had gone to Ireland as a babysitter and that they'd had a relationship and they got married and then he goes into arriving up there that night um, and he starts off by saying that he was clearly under the influence but he was polite and they'd order pizza. Yeah, I was going to say that. They've both said that then. I mean, she has said that he was drunk and Tom has also claimed that he was full of drink. But again, the toxicology results state different. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's less than the legal mm-hmm. driving limit in Ireland. Um, and then he sets the scene again. This is again two or three minutes into the interview. He said the marriage has not been a good one. That's a dad feeling. And he kind of says something that's not entirely clear about maybe no one being good enough for his daughter. And he said he was abusive, usually, to my knowledge, not physically abusive, which I think is very Mm -hmm. interesting to say here. So he's saying he's abusive, but not physically abusive. He's that's he's actually admitting that. Mm. But he grabbed her or whatever. And I don't think she told us everything, but he was very controlling and abusive. And then he goes and says, I would play golf with the guy. It's kind of a derogatory way of saying and he, he kind of mentions later that he was to suggest that his wife would encourage him or, or make him hang out with Jason. OK. And calling him the guy is a bit derogatory when he's a son-in-law, really. And he says he would send texts, I mean, hole after hole, which I didn't get to see. But and she didn't talk to me much about this, but she would talk to her mother about how cruel, abusive and controlling he was. So he's saying he gets these texts, he, he doesn't see them and she didn't talk to him about it. And yeah. he wasn't physically abusive. So he says all that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. In between two or three minutes, but he's still setting out loaded kind of bombs there for the detectives to kind of. Maybe he's saying this because, well, I suppose there has to be a level of proof then if you said that there was domestic abuse. There was. It's hard to imagine how you'd behave in the situation yourself. I mean, it always is in these. You always have to kind of, you know, say that before anything else. But he does look very relaxed in that interview room and uh you know, he, even the way he's sitting, he's uh, very open chested 
and uh, he's his coffee on the table and he's sipping it. There's no shaking hands or anything going on. He's um, somebody who has three or four hours previously um, tried to give CPR to his son-in-law who is dying on the floor or is dead on the floor of, of the, the bedroom of his daughter's house. Um, he's just really calm, isn't he? And do you think that's because of his background in law enforcement or? Yeah, it's interesting. There's no emotion there. Very, very little mm. emotion. And he's almost conversational about what had happened. Mm. You know, he's just he's just giving the information. But there isn't, I don't know, would you imagine you'd be going, oh, my God, I can't believe mm. that we injured him so badly and we didn't mean to kill him. And, you know, even if he was explaining he was in this fight, but I didn't think it would go that far. And mm -hmm. there's no sense of regret that he was dead. You don't hear that in the interview. You don't hear it. No, no. And you have the full interview. I mean, look, clips of it will be shown um on the documentary, but you have seen the full interview from start to finish. It's not as if you're just picking and choosing. And, um, you know, at the end, at the very end of the interview, you know, it's finished. And then there's there's a, a gap of maybe 10 or 15 minutes. I think he goes and changes his clothes. And then he's kind of having chit chat conversation with the detectives about different things. So it's just you don't see him shaking. You don't see him, you know, breaking mm. down. It's just, it's, he's behaving very, very normally in a very abnormal situation, I think. Mm -hmm. You don't see what you expect of a human being who's, you know, watched somebody die or has been responsible for somebody's death, whether he, you know, it was self-defence or he murdered him. That will all play out again in a, another trial. But nonetheless, he still died at his hands and he's admi he's admitting that. Um, he does very much describe what happened as self-defence. And both he and Molly Martins have stuck to that from the moment this happened. Yes, absolutely. He says he runs up the stairs and opens the bedroom door and he's got her by the throat and he says, let her go. And then his son-in-law would say, I'm going to kill her. And then he starts to think in his head and he tells the detectives, he looks like he knows what he's doing. He's going to cut off the blood there. I'm scared to death. I think he's going to kill her. And then I hit him with the baseball bat. Mm. So th he's giving this. And then he describes this ensuing tussle all around the bedroom um, where th he was hit with the bat and he claims Jason got the bat at one stage and then he got the bat back. He's asked, interestingly, about the, the brick and mm -hmm. he doesn't, he says he's no knowledge of that. But he has a very detailed explanation about why he has the baseball bat. He does. He said that he brought it up from one of his sons to give to Jack Corbett, who was into baseball. And Jack Corbett was at a party that night and he wasn't collected till later. So he had a chance to give it to him and it was downstairs in the basement with him and his wife, Sharon. And when he heard this thing kick off, he grabbed it and ran upstairs. Yes. Mm. And at the same time, Molly Martins has also a very detailed explanation of why she has a weapon, which is namely the brick in her room. She suggests that herself and the children were going to paint them and use them as decorative objects for the garden. Yes. Mm. So Molly Martins, while she is, um, you know, clearly very traumatised by what's happening, she has a number of clear things in her head, namely the children, her house and, uh, the, you know, breaking the news to, to Jason's family. What what are the things she says about those? Yes, yeah, so the the police woman in the interview room tells her, you know, your husband didn't survive his injuries, and she says, I didn't think so, and kind of dissolves into sobs. And then she says about the police woman asks her about contacting his family in Ireland, and she's very little girl lost at this stage. She said, you know, what will they be told? And then she says, what if I'm scared of his family? Seems like a bizarre thing mm. to say. She said, because I'm scared they will try and kill me or because I'm alive and I'm scared they'll try and take the kids. And then the officer points out, you know, the, you guys are legally married. Did you adopt the children? And when she says no, she tells her that's a real possibility. And she dissolves into sobs. And this is where you see the real emotion come out because up to then she's there's been a, f a few tears, but she absolutely dissolves into so sobs when she's, it's the first time maybe she's heard that she might be able to keep the children. Um, and she says, but I've raised them. And she's just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. And then 
further on in the, the interview a minute or two later, she asks, you know, about going home and the officer's kind of wrapping up the interview and she said, when we go, it's going to be clean. So, you know, basically, is the crime scene? Is the blood going to be gone? Is it all going to be sanitised by the time she gets back? And the officer says, there's going to be quite a, li- a bit of blood. Your husband bled a lot and it's quite a bit of blood in the bedroom. Um, so this is... It's a bit of an understatement when we come to the actual crime scene, which while Tom and Molly Martins are telling one story and one version of events in the interview rooms to the police, I think the crime scene tells a different story and that story is within those files you have in front of you. So a lot of people have described the crime scene as showing what we call an overkill. What is it like, I suppose, without being too graphic from the photographs you have? It's, I was speaking to a law enforcement officer who was there that morning at six or seven o'clock in the morning. He was saying it, it was just immediately when he walked in, he saw a very, very aggressive situation. It was just signs of extreme violence there. There was furniture knocked over. There was lamps knocked over. There was blood all over the room. Um blood on the walls and there's indentations from the from the bat. There's blood all over the bat. There's blood on the brick. It's mm. it's a really chaotic scene. The bed covers are kind of And those two those two weapons have been left there strewn in the middle of this. Mm. They're there in the room. Mm. And the blood stains go into the bathroom, out and into the hall and Yeah. It is pretty it's it's a very gruesome scene. It's a very tragic scene. It's it's there's blood on the walls. There's blood on the floor. There's it just shows just it went everywhere around the bedroom. Mm-hmm. There's very few pieces of the bedroom that aren't. There's blood even leading out to the front door. And in that sort of and I know blood spatter evidence is some of the best science there is in crime scenes. I think it's some of the most developed and it tells a lot um, of stories. Is used very robustly in court cases. What sort of a battle, as Tom Martins calls it, did those blood splatters tell there was? Was was it, you know, was was it ever clear where this beating started or where it ended or how it played out? So the blood splatter evidence can show, sometimes on clothes, it can show whether the blood was soaked upwards, whether the person was on the ground, where, Mm. where the person was. Judging from the the pattern of blood and where it was sprayed, they can kind of detect where a person was and, and, and whether they were on the ground when they were hit or whether they were upright. And this was um, part of the reason, this, this blood splatter evidence was one of the reasons why they have got a retrial. So this will play out in, in court when they go back into court, possibly in 2022. So presumably there are experts looking at all these things at the moment and and when they go back to court, the the answers to that will certainly be heard or the jury will be told what the experts believe. There's files and files and there's there's pictures of tiny fibres of blood and there's there's files and files on the blood splatter evidence because it was kind of key because it Mm. would show, it would show where the person was when they were hit, which Mm. is key then in a situation whether you're you're claiming self-defence or not. And what about the autopsy report? What does that show? How did Jason Corbett actually die? The cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head, but there was numerous hits to his head, numerous lacerations, contusions. There was other signs of injuries to his face, to his forehead, to his eye socket. Um, And also there was abrasions to his left shoulder and various other parts of his body. So just numerous injuries, numerous injuries to the head. And as far as we can see from the interview room tapes we have, there was no injuries to either Tom or Molly. No visible. No visible injuries. So you've interviewed a number of people in connection with this inquiry and people who would have been friends with with Jason and indeed Molly. Um, From the law enforcement point of view, when they went to interview neighbours and friends and all the rest of it, did they find anything of this sort of tale of domestic violence that she and Tom claim was playing out? So I spoke to a law enforcement officer who was investigating the case and there was friends interviewed. 
in the area and there was never any evidence of domestic abuse. They also looked into, they couldn't find any doctor's reports. They couldn't find any evidence of domestic abuse when they looked for it. One of the officers also pointed out that she was a swim instructor in her locality, you know, so she was often in a, the swimming pool in a swimsuit and, you know, again, nobody would have seen any evidence of bruises or... Mm. So nothing there um, to back up that story that they have, have given. And I thought one of the most interesting interviews and most insightful ones you've done and... Um, you know, it will, it'll, parts of it will be used in the documentary, is with Keith McGinn, who is an ex-boyfriend of Molly's. And actually, he told you that he was still going out with her and he thought engaged at the time she went to Ireland. He didn't have a clue she was uh, leaving him. Absolutely. It's your, it's the, what they call ghosting, I think, today, mm. 21st century. Yeah, no, it's a classic case of ghosting. He was engaged to her. He said she bowled him over. He met her on an online dating site and they hit it off straight away. Thought she was the most beautiful person in the world. And then, you know, a bit. Of, he worked for Habitat for Humanity and they were very in love. And then she became, um, her personality changed overnight and he found out that she had psychiatric issues. Um, and he stuck with her, you know, and he was still very much in love. But he, he mentioned that the proposal was to try and make her feel better in one of her uh, depressions and she accepted it. And then she she would often, you know, not leave the house for days. She went into quite deep depressions. He would he describe this and they got engaged. And then she came up to him one day and said she was going to start nannying and she was going to look into nannying in Europe. And he didn't take what she said really seriously. And then she said she was going to be gone for a week and then she heard her say somebody else that she was going to be gone for three weeks and he never heard from her again. He was trying to contact her and contact her and was phoning her and phoning her and she, after she went to Ireland and he got an email mm -hmm. to say that she was going to stay there and that was the end of their relationship. And we can hear him here describing that moment um, for himself. The first time I met her, I was just floored because she was stunning. To her credit, she did tell me early on that she had bipolar. She was no longer able to work or anything. She pretty much couldn't keep a job. She couldn't do the nannying stuff anymore. I think we had been together around a year and we got engaged. So then she told me one night that she was going to look for jobs uh, nannying in Europe. And I thought, man, here we go again. One of her crazy ideas. She said, hey, I'm going to go in Ireland. She told me, I think initially she was going to be gone for like a week. And then I think it might have been like 10 days before I heard anything. I knew she was not in a good mental state whatsoever. I didn't know how safe it was for her to be going over and nannying for somebody's children. We had just been in a psych ward. So I knew she wasn't in a mental state to do it. So she finally emailed and said, sorry for not calling you, but I also don't know if I'm ever coming back. I need to move on. What I found out later was that not only did I not exist when she went to Ireland, but she and Jason started a relationship very quickly. Within 24 hours of Jason's death, Molly has made a formal adoption declaration to the courts. And I suppose these documents tell us the importance of the children to her. She's looking to adopt them. Um, they have walked out of the station having given those interviews pretty confident that this is a clear case of self-defense. Um, what happens in the in the months that follow? Well, it has emerged that you, throughout their relationship that Molly wanted to formally adopt the children and Jason always resisted this. So within 24 hours, she, she puts in a, an application after he's died. But in his will, he has said that he wants his sister and her husband, Tracy Corbett Lynch and David Lynch, to be the legal guardians of his children. And there's a court case then uh, pretty quickly in North Carolina. And it, maybe it was a surprise to some people, but the um, Irish couple got custody of the children and they flew home to Ireland with them immediately. And in the meantime, the investigation is ongoing, while even the police seemed pretty convinced during those interviews um, with Molly and Tom that their 
you know, it was a case of self-defense. I mean, I think even the female detective that interviews Molly says to her, states to her, this is a clear case. Um, so what, what, what happens that obviously changes the mind of the police and what's going on behind the scenes that convinces them that all is not as they have laid out? Well, when I spoke to Sheriff Grice a few years ago, he said as soon as he walked into the scene, he started to think that there was something very wrong there with their story, that there was, you know, a sense that he knew, as, he said as soon as he walked into the room that a very violent struggle had taken place and it just didn't tie in with their version of events. Um, I suppose then they tried to further investigate the allegations of domestic abuse and they didn't seem to come up with anything there either. But it was essentially the scene told its own, own story. It was the third witness. It was it, it, the, the blood splatter, the amount of blood, the amount of injuries, the fact that they had no injuries. This was all tying into a case and they knew that there was something very seriously wrong there. Mm. So it was basically the crime scene that that gave up those charges of, of murder and they were... Eventually, um, I think in the, in the intervening months, Molly continued to try and reach out to the children here in, in Ireland in a number of bizarre ways. And she used her Facebook page to try and talk with them and, you know, etc. But um, in the months that followed, she was shut down with that when she was charged with murder along with her father. Yeah, it was on the 4th of January 2016 uh, they were formally charged with second-degree murder and voluntary manslaughter. So they're charged January 2016, they're released on bail and the trial starts in July 2017. In the meantime, they're back in Tennessee. Molly's back in Tennessee in the home where she grew up with her parents. OK, so she moves back in essentially with her parents, Molly, and they're waiting for the trial, which gets underway at some point in 2017. Yeah, the summer of 2017, July 2017, it gets underway in Davison County mm. uh, in front of a jury. There was huge media attention on it. There was huge media attention from America and Ireland. But the fact that he was an FBI agent and mm. she was a very beautiful young girl and then there was the Irish connection, it really did seem to generate a huge... That just shows the significance of the case and the crime and obviously the alleged perpetrator's well, there's loads of different things. I mean, the, the the sheriff has said to me that they had never been called to a murder in this place, Panther Creek. It's a really exclusive estate. It's, you know, they have a golf course there. There's swimming pools. Mm. So that that's an unusual thing. And then the FBI agent is extremely unusual mm -hmm. for an FBI agent to be charged with murder in the States. So there's a, and then there's the, the Irish connection. Yeah, yeah. So the... They vigorously denied murder. They admitted, both of them, that they had killed Jason Corbett. That was without question. She said that she hit him with the brick and he said he hit him with the baseball bat. And they essentially, you know, repeated the claims, the story that they made that first day in the interview room. It was... He said he woke up, he heard the scuffle, went up and found Jason trying, as he believed, to kill his daughter. And he acted in self-defense of her when he when he struggled with him and beat him. Yeah, yes. Uh, Tom Martins took the stand. No, Molly Martins didn't take the stand. But the, the story that he had told in the interview rooms was more or less what, what mm -hmm. he gave in evidence in court. They must have been absolutely shocked and gutted when, when they were found guilty. Yes, I spoke to the sheriff about this afterwards. Yeah, he said they, th there was lots of crying. He said, interestingly, he said he didn't see much emotion between the father and the daughter. He said he was expecting more emotion. He said he might have touched her leg or mm. something like that. But he found it kind of a cool mm -hmm. atmosphere before they took off that he was looking for medication. I think he had some medical issues and he was asking, could he keep his wedding ring? But he didn't. You didn't see signs of, again, that the emotion wasn't hugely there. Mm -hmm. Now, as in all court cases, um, you know, if somebody is found guilty, they usually will head away to prison and regroup with their lawyers in order to work out how they can appeal and, you know, how a judge maybe mismanaged a case or, you know, 
sometimes there will be stuff left in jury rooms or they'll always come up with aspects that they can challenge uh, in order to have a second go at trying to get freedom. Um, in this case, I think they appealed the decision. And what happened with the appeals court or what did the appeals court rule? So the Court of Appeals overturned the original trial decision and then that was appealed by the state to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. and the Supreme Court sided with the Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. So the situation now is that they are expected to go to for a retrial on the same charges in 2022. Mm -hmm. But the the aspects of the case that they, they brought up, there was clear aspects that they brought up that they said were unfair to them and didn't give them a fair a fair trial, essentially, was some interviews conducted with the children, both in the US and later in Ireland, um, with social workers, that they weren't allowed in as put in as evidence and the appeals court did find that that wasn't fair, that that evidence should have been put in. And, and the second point was there was issues around the blood splatter evidence that the appeals court again um, ruled in their favour on. So the the state took it to the Supreme Court because they wanted the original verdict upheld. Uh, the Supreme Court sided with the appeals court, as you say, and we're back to square one. Yes. So they're, they're, they're now they are having to gather all the evidence again. I suppose mm -hmm. they have a lot of the evidence, but they're having to do the same thing as they would do for the original trial. And also because of COVID in America, there's been delays. So mm -hmm. a lot of trials are backlogged. So they are again out in bail right. now awaiting trials. So they will go back into court. It's expected it'll be somewhere in the middle of 2022. And we saw the images of them walking free from, from court, um, you know, Molly, maybe just not looking quite as glamorous, but I'm sure, in fairness, anybody who spent a few years in prison wouldn't be. Um, the files that, you know, that you have collected and the video evidence of the scene and these interviews are all essentially at the heart again of this new case. That yes. is the evidence. So this is the testimony from the two of them, three hours after Jason Corbett was brutally beaten to death. Um, it's it's what they've said to detectives immediately after the event took place. Mm -hmm. Nothing will change with that. Mm. So by the time this trial opens in, at whatever point during 2022, um, it'll be seven years since Jason Corbett was, was, was beaten to death. Um, it must be extremely hard on his children, on his family, to have to face into this trial process again, um, for there to be no closure for them. And, um, you know, it's an ongoing nightmare, isn't it? I suppose we would say our thoughts are with the family. And um, there doesn't seem to be any winners in this case, one way or another, no matter what happens going forward. But, but nonetheless, another trial uh, to face into. And after that, I think they're aware of themselves. They could be looking at another appeal and another Supreme Court. It just seems to go on and on. The victims certainly are, are never, ever the winners in these cases. So for today, Lynn Keller, thank you very much. Thank you.